our major headlines for the week ending June 8. Manningham robbery in Kayuni River minus fear Sindicato gang. 219 cases listed for the June Demerara seizures. Water suicide works Glasgow New Houseman scheme. And the Ghana and Venezuela to meet at the ICJ. Those were the top headlines for the week ending June 8. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's weekend review, we tell you that another mining camp, this time in the Kiyuni River, has allegedly came under attack by bandits suspected to be the infamous Handicato gang operating out of neighboring Venezuela. Here's more from Nikhil Jondu. Command of Interior Locations Kevin Adonis says they are still investigating the robbery at Blackwater Kiyuni River. The robbery took place last Wednesday as four alleged bandits stormed the mining camp and made good their escape with guns, gold and ammunition, among other valuables. According to the police, the workers had just washed down and were about to burn the gold when the masked men stormed the camp. In recent months, several mining camps were robbed by foreign-speaking persons in the Cuyuni River. It is believed that the recent spate of robberies have been carried out by the infamous Sinicata gang operating out of neighboring Venezuela. The Ghana police force had stated that they do face challenges when responding to reports of robberies in the interior. The force had also noted that, due to the vastness of the terrain, lack of resources and manpower contributes to the growing challenges. The government had responded to the plight of the miners in those areas, however, the miners remain at the mercy of the Sinicato gang. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Major traffic congestion is now being reduced as the long-awaited $79 million Kitty Roundabout has been officially declared open by the Ministry of Public Infrastructure. The Shana Gomes Cronenis has that story. The $79 million structure, which incorporates aesthetics and instructions, will allow for the smooth flow of traffic. This is according to Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson, who was at the time addressing the official launch of the Kitty roundabout. The next part of the puzzle, of course, was we, we had the replacing of all the pipe works um, on the where we stand, right on, right on where we're sitting here, um, there are new pipe works. You can remember that was done in 2017 and um, the contractor for that was Colin Talbert and that entailed us putting new um, culverts um, pipes all the way from Kitty from um, Vicinjan Road and from Carfest Avenue all leading to the to the new pump to the pump station there and that was to improve and help improve the, the drainage in the area as well as well as to set a firm base for us to build what we have here while majority of the work is already completed, the painting of sidewalks and apron as well as the installation of traffic lights and landscaping is yet to be finalized. The, after in immense discussion, we have decided that the landscaping the, will depict flowers of the Caribbean in keeping with Carfest Avenue. So, um, so in there we will be um, planting flowers of the Caribbean. The methodology, before anyone asks, will be a public-private partnership, and so we'll be um, engaging suitable private sector partners to work with us, um, since we do think this is a national project. Um, we have some painting of the mediums and the curbs. I mean, these curbs that are right here and around, they are supposed to be painted and um, have with reflective paints. So we have that to complete uh, and, and those both pole bases, but, but those will be done in-house by the ministry quite shortly. The looping junction has been created to accommodate the road traffic congestion coming from the three directions. S. Jagmahan Hardware Supplies and Construction Services was awarded a $78.9 million contract earlier in the year for works on the roundabout. The ministry is also expected to mount two similar structures at locations on the Sheriff Street embankment and at Tamiri. Reporting from TV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. ExxonMobil has recommitted itself to environmental safety as the company continues to exploit Guyana's natural resources during their offshore exploration in the Stavro Block. Find out more in this report. 
Senior Director of Government and Public Affairs at ExxonMobil Guyana, Kimberly Bracenton, during an exclusive interview says, the environment is a much needed conversation as the company exploits Guyana's natural resources. Bracenton said the environment is important to everyone given its emotional scope. Um, but Guyana is so gorgeous and pristine in its environment and natural habitat and so you're right we need to ensure and reassure Guyanese people that we're committed to operating responsibly. We don't want anything to go wrong here. We don't want there to be a mishap and so everything we do in our operations work to prevent that. While the U.S. oil giant is focused on protecting the environment during the exploiting of natural resources, they also signaled their duty to ensure all regulations are in place. However, those regulations and environmental impact assessments will only be effective when placed in the context. As such, a simulation exercise was facilitated to engage stakeholders on the preparations of an oil spill. And there have been incidents in our industry in other parts of the world, but none of them are ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil has not had an offshore deep water oil spill or release incident. And we're committed to not ever having that happen. You, know, you prevent it, you put measures in place to prevent it. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. 219 cases with majority for sexual offenses are expected to be heard in the next three months as a June 2018 session of the Demar Assizes opens. Here again is Nikhil Jondu. The June 2018 session of the Demerara Assizes opened on June 5 at the High Court. Taking the salute and inspecting the Guard of Honor was Justice Priya Sinarain Bihari. 219 court matters are expected to be dealt with during a three months duration. Three judges will be tasked with overseeing the cases, after which they will pronounce final judgment. Justice Joan Barlow is expected to oversee 148 matters in the Sexual Offences Court. Meanwhile, 37 cases are listed on Justice James Bovell Drake's panel, all for criminal cases. Justice Sandel Kisun, who will also be presiding on criminal matters, will see 34 cases. The majority of cases brought before the Demerara Assizes are for sexual offenses. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. President David Grange is urging Guyanese to curtail the use of single-use plastics as it poses a serious challenge to Guyana's environmental security. This is as the world observes World Environmental Day 2018 and June 5 under the team Beating Plastic Pollution. Here are the details. As the world observes Environment Day, President David Granger warned against the use of single-use plastics as it poses a serious challenge for the environment. Plastic pollution has over time contributed to congested drainage systems, resulting in flooding and insanitary conditions. With Guyana emerging into a green state, policies are expected to be developed for protecting the environment by reducing and eliminating plastic pollution. As such, the head of state urged for persons to curtail the use of single-use plastics, disposing of plastics responsibly and switching to environmentally friendly alternatives. Also championing the environment, Director of Solid Waste Management Walter Narine says he will be throwing his support behind the government for the proposed ban on single-use plastics in the environment. Without thinking about future generations to come, we need to collectively change our behavior by exercising different choices towards plastic and reusable items. As the slogan say, if it can be used, refuse it. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Municipal Main City Council's point of view, we are advocating for and we are fully supporting the ban on single-use plastics. It has become significant because Georgetown, as you know, 
could only withstand four inches of rainfall at any given time. World Environment Day is observed under the theme Beating Plastic Pollution. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. While the Department of Environment is proposing the ban on single-use plastics, the private sector will not be throwing their support behind a proposal as they believe recycling is a better approach. Lashana Gomes, Cornelius, how's more? The Department of Environment engaged stakeholders on June 5 for a conversation on single-use plastics. During her brief remarks, Stakeholder Management Coordinator of the Department of Environment, Arita Ford, pointed to the negative effects the use of single-use plastics can have on the environment. Noting the vast use of plastics in the country, Ford says approximately 10% of the country's wastes are derived from plastics. Our utensils, the chairs that we sit on, um, almost everything in our lives is made of plastic. Um, we use approximately 500 billion plastic bags every year and the figures as it relates to plastic production and use are very staggering. Uh, we buy 1 million plastic bags every minute, that's 20,000 every second, every second. Um, Single-use items account for 50% of the marine litter. As such, the Department of Environment has presented to Cabinet a proposed document calling for a ban on the importation of single-use plastic items. With this, she urged persons to refuse accepting and using single-use plastic items. Of course, there is the proposed ban on single-use plastic products and we do expect your full support, um, not only in saying that yes, there should be a ban on single-use plastics, but also as individuals and organizations to institute policies and to take individual and household actions. Begin Tadefa was executive member of the Guyana Manufacturing and Services Association, Ramesh Duku, who proposed the recycling of single-use plastics. The answer is not to ban plastic bottles. The answer is to manage the waste of plastic bottles. And that is the view of the manufacturers in Guyana. We need to place some of the tax revenue being earned into the company as equity, and we need to make it work. Essentially, we need to recycle the plastics that take five to 10 years to buy a degree. The conversation also saw an insightful discussion from the panel comprising of the private sector and government officials. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Glasgow housing scheme on the east bank of Barbies was rocked by a murder suicide after a man killed his wife and daughter and later hanged himself. Nikhil Jondu with the details. The gruesome discovery of the mother and daughter was made by neighbors of Glasgow, New Housing Scheme East Bank, Burbies. The dead woman has been identified as 38-year-old Bedamati Sitaram and her 21-year-old daughter Anila Khan. The murder suspect, Jainarain Sitaram, is said to be on the run after committing the brutal killing. At the time of the incident, the wife was in the company of the suspect in the lower flat of the house, when an argument ensued, his daughter and 12-year-old son were occupying the upper flat at that time. The suspect, who allegedly armed himself with a hammer, used the tool and dealt several lashes to his wife's head. As if that was not enough, the man then armed himself with a knife and inflicted several stab wounds about the woman's body. Neighbors said after his daughter heard a commotion, she and her brother ran to the scene. However, the suspect used a hammer to inflict similar harm on his daughter while his son ran out of the yard. Meanwhile, police have indicated that the man accused his wife of having an extramarital affair. The police also stated that the suspect told the now dead woman to remove herself from the house. However, she refused to comply with the man's order. The suspect was subsequently found hanging from an abandoned house. Both murder weapons were recovered by the ranks in B Division. Investigations are in progress. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. 
President David Granger is withdrawing himself from the clash on Ghan Elections Commission ethnic composition, which saw a walkout by the PPP commissioners at the agency's statutory meeting on June 5. Here again is Nikhil Jondu. The opposition People's Progressive Party has voiced its concern at the way in which Chairman of GCOM, Justice James Patterson, muzzled one of its members to speak at a statutory meeting on Tuesday, June 5, 2018. Commissioner Robson Ben was prevented from defending his position that the ethnic composition of staff at the institution is derived from one particular ethnicity. The PPP in a statement said Justice Patterson adjourned the meeting for half an hour before resuming it again. When that was done, the party claims that Commissioner Ben would not be recognized and he would not be participating for the remainder of the meeting. That set the stage for the PPP commissioners to walk out of the meeting. In an invited comment, President David Granger says the executive branch is not involved in the recruitment of staff for the agency. As such, the government will not be interfering in the line of work set out by the autonomous body. I expect that they'll be following normal practice in having persons who are fit and proper, persons who are qualified to hold positions in, the, uh, in, the, in that commission. I'm not aware of the procedures, but I expect that the procedures will be above board and they want to get the best persons to do the job. So I'm not um, party to any process for the selection of um, persons for GCOM. A new member of my government is party to that process. Thank you. It's an autonomous institution. The opposition party, who is peeved with the incident, believes the action of Justice Patterson was a blatant attempt to censor and muzzle discussion on critical and important issues at the Commission. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Vendors again are bemoaning the state of the Starbrook Market Wharf, which continues to deteriorate as a result of the lack in rehabilitation services for decades. Yanis Abrams tells us more. The condition of the Starbrook Market Wharf as it continues to worsen poses a serious threat to vendors and customers alike. Vendors expressed concern as the wharf has not been maintained in decades. Some vendors even pointed to the hazardous condition in which they are forced to ply their trade. Well, the, the wharf was handed over in 1986, the 12th of May. The 12th of May, the wharf was handed over. And uh, in the 23 years of the PPP, they has not do no kind of maintenance. No maintenance to the WAF. The WAF is only around 31, 32 years old, and I don't think that it should have been in this condition. If they didn't maintain the WAF, it would have been in better condition. They just leave it to deteriorate. So uh, now everybody's fighting for the WAF to be over. It seems to me that City Hall um, Council has no funds to do it over. But if they didn't maintain it, would have been in a better condition. Tom Clark Royston King says vendors there will be relocated in a month's time to pave the way for the reconstruction of the wharf. Approximately 800 vendors will be relocated to unidentified locations to facilitate the reconstruction. The modernization of the facility is estimated to be between a duration of 12 to 18 months. We have not received any additional word from the Ministry of Public Infrastructure with respect to the project to restore that particular facility, that is the Starbrook Market Wharf. But we know that they are tidying up their arrangements to begin works. We anticipate that within another month, we should be in a position to relocate those vendors who are operating uh, at that facility. The physical condition is completely unacceptable and in fact it is unsafe and therefore there is some amount of urgency with respect to the committee and the council uh, with respect to their action to remove 
those vendors and to relocate them to a place that is acceptable, like I said, one that is designated. King had indicated that the rehabilitation of the wharf will cost in excess of $400 million. The modernized municipal wharf is expected to feature a two-story building with a terrace and a stelling for boats to dock. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Finally, Guyana will face Venezuela at the International Court of Justice as the two countries are scheduled to meet on June 18 for the filing of the written pleadings in the case. Here's more. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela has finally conceded to join Guyana at the International Court of Justice. This move is seen here at home, a good move to have the border controversy settle once for all time. President David Granger urged future generations not to be threatened by the demonstration of aggression from the Venezuelans. The ongoing border controversy has elapsed over 52 years. We have struggled long and hard, and uh, the decision that was taken by uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres is a correct decision at this point in time. And we want to move forward. We want uh, future generations to be able to live in a country that is not under the shadow of Venezuelan threat. The two countries will meet at the International Court of Justice on June 18 to voice their point of view on the pending land matter. Details surrounding the initial dispute are also expected to be discussed. Guyana filed an application against Venezuela at the ICJ on Thursday, March 29, 2018. In their application, Guyana requested the court to confirm the legal validity and binding effect of the 1899 award. Guyana claimed that the 1899 award was a full, perfect and final settlement of all questions relating to determining the boundary line between the colony of British Guyana and Venezuela. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Abate. While information is still sketchy, one suspect has been arrested following the fatal stabbing of Richmond Noel of Kitty on Monday, June 4, 2018. Nikhil John, Duke with the details. The police are still hunting for the suspect who allegedly stabbed Richmond Noel to death on Monday last. Noel of Lot 39 William Street, Kitty, Georgetown was stabbed while in the vicinity of the Starbrook Market. He was allegedly stabbed to his left side chest during an argument with a known character. Mother of the deceased, Geranium Cliff, says much has not been disclosed by the police on the matter. Cliff said she was told by officers that one of the suspects is arrested. She said the second suspect is still on the run. On the day of the incident, the mother said her son was at the time heading to the city to purchase medication for his one-year-old child. It was at that time the alleged killers approached her son, who escaped from the scene. The deceased was met with yet another altercation on Sunday, where in the company of his brother on the Kitty Sea Wall. The fearful mother also pointed out that threats are being hurled at her second child, coming from the said suspects. She said a police report has been lodged at the Kitty police station. Richmond Noah leaves to mourn the mother of his child, mother and six siblings. Investigations are ongoing. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The opposition party is laying blame against the Ghana Elections Commission for demonstrating preferential treatment for one particular ethnic makeup at the agency. Yanis Abrams has more. Opposition leader Barra Jagdio says preferential treatment and biases have been demonstrated by the Guiana Elections Commission. He claimed that persons of Indo descent are oftentimes exposed to a discrimination during the job application process. However, Jagdio provided no evidence to substantiate his claims. The assertion came on the heels of a clash between PPP Commissioner Robson Ben and Chairman of GCOM, James Patterson. Commissioner Ben was prevented from defending his position that the ethnic composition of staff at the institution is derived from one particular ethnicity, according to the opposition. So that is what it's about. It's about diversity. It is about fairness. It's about equity. 
the right of a Ghanaian to be treated if I apply in there, I should be treated fairly. And Dr. Lonchon has pointed out about the information coming to us now that he has had, that the APNU com nominated commissioners are zero rating in some cases. Jagdeo also took the time to question the ethnicity composition of the agency. He believes facts of the ethnic composition of the agency are not true. I was surprised that Vincent Alexander said, because so far we have been going anecdotally, based on the names that we have seen in the top leadership of GCOM, we can't count everybody in the villages and stuff like that. But the senior leadership here is what matters, the management structures. And, we, and then we, Vincent Alexander said, we don't keep information on ethnicity. And the same day he said this, that, the, the, the chairman of GCOM released to the media the composition of the staff based on ethnicity. So who is lying? Vincent Alexander? Is it the chairman? Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Giant Exxon Mobil is making good on their promise to ensure local businesses and individuals are included in their operations in keeping with a draft local content policy. Nikhil Jondu has that story. Exxon Mobil Guyana says it wishes to clarify uncertainties regarding the list published by the government days ago. The oil giant made it clear that all the companies or individuals listed by the government would have provided a product or a service to either them or one of their main contractors. Those products or services would have supported the company's operations in Guyana. The first list that was published by the government had more than 200 plus companies and individuals as suppliers for the first quarter of 2018. Companies will come, companies will go, and they will say what their interpretation is. But it is for us as a people to determine what local content is. We have actually released the contracts and we believe that that level of transparency, that level of accountability is unheard of in Guyana previously. The government is still said to be working on the draft local content policy. The policy will give preference to Guyanese where capability exists and develop competencies where the demand support requires local investment among others. The policy will be brought to the National Assembly for debate at a future date. We will eventually come to that point when we have the legislation debated in the National Assembly. And that is what I would like to say. I would not want to speculate as to you know, what is an interpretation to be given to a fact. That is to say a fact of the matter is that the publication has been made about companies that are benefiting and so on from the investment that is taking place here in Guyana. And beyond that, I would not wish to venture. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The government will be making a pronouncement that a hike in fuel prices following the Ministry of Business's engagement with the United Minibus Union. Yanis Abrams with that story. Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson says the Ministry of Business has been handed the responsibility to engage the United Minibus Union. The engagement will pave the way for addressing existing concerns faced by motorists as a result of the hike in fuel prices. The government minister of business is engaging uh, the various minibuses association and we've asked them to document, I mean, because obviously document um, their, their, um, all their issues so we, so we can address it um, holistically. So that's there, that is the point where we are at in the moment. Uh, we are engaging them. No decision has been made um, as yet on the on the final um, what we shall do. During the much anticipated engagement, a fruitful negotiation will be concluded in the best interest of motorists and passengers. Um, I mean, if there's if, if gas prices will be moved, um, if what are the issues? We don't want to. We want to look at it holistically, and that's what we're doing in the moment. So engaging them. This followed protest actions by drivers 
who are peeved by the increased prices. The prices of fuel is said to have hiked as a result of the impact of hurricanes on the oil industry. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. The City Council will be extending their cleanup campaign after an astounding success in ensuring the city remains clean and green in keeping with the President's Green State agenda. Kebony Jordan reports. Public Relations Officer of City Hall, Deborah Lewis, says the cleanup campaign will be extended to other communities. This followed the success of the initial cleanup campaign, which was launched in May. The campaign was convened in an effort to build better relationships with residents and business owners. We had a proportion of many vendors and many um, business owners who came forward and lent their support and really brought the needs of I think the exercise was fruitful and successful. Lewis asked that residents give their full cooperation during the exercise as all tools necessary for the cleanup will be provided by the council. Looking at um, areas such as Atlantic Bay, we're looking at small areas, Lemaha Park, we're looking at Newton Kids to have the same exercise that has been done right in Luxembourg and Gardens. But of course we have to meet with the residents and explain to them the whole process and to get their buy -in. Communities will be selected following an assessment carried out by the council. The initial campaign saw the cleanup of Lacey Town and Bordeaux from King Street to Albert Street running east to west and from South Road to Rob Street running north to south. Kippany Jordan reporting for MTV's News Update. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates We can Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, June 11 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.